Hello everyone, uh, welcome to all the ENT residents who are watching this video with me Dr. Vaishnavi and today I am going to represent the topic in the form of an answer discussion or how you should put your answer in the examination. So I will be discussing the topic but in the form of an answer sheet where I shall be giving you the important pointers, the headings that you cannot miss to go to the exam. This is the part one of the video. If you like the part one of the video do mention in the comment section that you like it and you would want the part two as well. So if, you, if I see the comments coming in in the comment section below then I will of course upload the part two of this. So here here we are going to discuss mainly the definition and the pathogenesis of chronic otitis media. Of course, the symptom signs diagnosis treatment is a part two of the video. So if you guys are really interested, do let me know in the comment section below. So let's discuss here. So this is going to be in a terminology that I have that is going to be more textbookish. But if you're writing your examination, you can always make this your own language and make the lines very familiar to whatever is comfortable to you. But at the moment, it's going to be universal so that it's easily understood by everyone. So whenever we're talking about chronic otitis media, whenever there's a question on chronic otitis media, in general, if they have not specified anything, then how do we start? So first and foremost, you should know the definition of chronic otitis media, which is a must know for each one of you, because you have to define the chronic otitis media very appropriately to get your marks right in the quest exam. So first we will understand what is chronic otitis media. So chronic otitis media refers to a permanent abnormality of the pars tensa or pars placida of the tympanic membrane. So remember that whenever we're talking about COM or chronic otitis media, there's a permanent perforation which could be in the pars tensa or pars flaccida. So here they're telling that there is an abnormality, usually in the form of perforation. Sometimes there can also be a retraction. So here, why does it occur? It can occur due to previous acute otitis media or because of negative middle ear pressure, because of eustachian tubal dysfunction or because of chronic middle ear effusion. If there's effusion that's lying in the middle ear for a prolonged period of time, then you can have this chronic otitis media. Now, what are the terminologies that we use in chronic otitis media? Media. The terminology that we use here is chronic otitis media only. It is no longer called as chronic saturative otitis media. What is the reason behind this? Because in chronic otitis media, there is no longer an entity that there has to be pus. So it does not always involve the presence of pus. So when we say saturative, it means pus. But in chronic otitis media, there is no such rule that there has to be pus in the middle ear. There can be situations where there is no pus in the middle ear as well. Now we have different types of chronic otitis media. We can have an active or an inactive COM. Whenever we say active, there is an ongoing inflammation and there is production of pus. So active COM is characterized by an ongoing inflammation and the presence of pus, whereas inactive there is no ongoing inflammation or pus, but there is a potential that it can become active again. So at the moment it is dry, but later it can become active again. So what are the two types, active and inactive? Active there is inflammation, there is pus. Inactive there is no inflammation, there is no pus, but it can become active if there is any water that enters or there is an URTI or if there is an infection in the middle ear that you see. Healed COM basically refers to a condition where you see that there is an abnormality of the pars tensa where it has healed. So there is a thinning of the membrane or there may be a tympanosclerotic patch but there is no perforation or there is no retraction. It has healed by itself. So here the ear does not have the propensity to become active because it has already healed. So when there is no perforation, what is the possibility that middle ear can get infected again? The probability is going to be extremely less. So here they do not have a probability that the ear can become active because the pars tensa is intact and there is a no significant retraction of pars tensa and pars flaccida. Now healed chronic otitis media can be spontaneous which can be very very rare but it can also be a result of a successful surgery. So if you have done a myringoplasty or a tympanoplasty then also you can have a healed COM. So what are the classifications that we use in chronic otitis media? Very, very important. So healed chronic otitis media or tympanosclerosis refers to a condition where there is thinning or generalized opacification of the pars tensa without perforation, without retraction. 
what is inactive type of, of disease where you have a perforation but the middle ear mucosa is not inflamed there is no ongoing inflammation there is no pus so there is a permanent perforation but middle ear mucosa is not inflamed that we call it as inactive mucosal what is active mucosal Active mucosal is a condition where you see that there is a permanent defect of the pars tensa but here the middle ear mucosa produces mucopus and discharge. This is active mucosal. What is inactive squamosal? Inactive squamosal is a disease where you have pars tensa posterior superior quadrant being involved or pars flaccida involvement with retraction and it has a potential to become active with retained debris. So right now there is no debris, there is no dis disease in the pars tensa or pars flaccida but it has a potential to become active. So this one is characterized by a retraction and not by a perforation and this retraction has no retained debris but it has a potential of becoming active again. What is active squamosal? Active squamosal is nothing but cholestatoma where you see there is retraction of the pars flaccida or the posterior superior quadrant of the pars tensa but here they additionally will have some retained debris along with inflammation. So these are the five important classifications that you should know for chronic otitis media. So these are five important classifications that you should know. One is healed. Mucosal disease will usually have a perforation. Inactive will have no pus. Active will have pus. Squamosal disease will usually have retraction. Inactive one will not have any keratin debris, will have, got, will have no inflammation. Whereas active one will have keratin debris and active cholesteatoma. So this is the basic guideline that you should know for chronic otitis media. Then there is a newer entity which we call it as eosinophilic otitis media where you see that there is this is a condition which occurs primarily in patients with asthma so when they have asthma when they have an hypersensitivity reaction in the airway they can also have hypersensitivity reaction in the middle ear type 1 type and this can result in eosinophilic otitis media where these patients have typically TH2 dominant immune response so it's a TH2 mediated immune response so how do we how do we understand that eosinophilic otitis media is occurring in the middle ear so basically what happens is there is a patulous eustachian tube and this eustachian tube allows the antigenic material which is there in the nose or the nasopharynx to enter into the middle ear and as a result this leads to eosinophilic inflammatory exudate in the middle ear and the key cytokine that is responsible for causing this eosinophilic otitis media is going to be your interleukin 5. So there is an antigen that is present in the nose. This antigen gains its entry into the middle ear via patchless eustachian tube. There it causes antigenic stimulus and produces inflammation. It is a TH2 mediated response. Interleukin 5 is responsible for causing this and they will have some clinical features which I am going to describe. So they will have a simple perforation but they will have thick yellow effusion coming from the middle ear. They will have proliferation of the granulation tissue extending into the external auditory canal which is often difficult to manage because this is secondary to an immune response. So whenever we have allergy, whenever we have asthma, whenever we have polypus, it's a very difficult condition to manage. So similarly, eosinophilic otitis media is difficult to manage. Infective conditions are still easy to treat because you treat the infection, treat the inflammation, it will resolve. But here it is because of an allergic response, so it's very difficult to manage. Now let's go to the pathology of the subtypes of chronic separative otitis media. I'll just tell you the most important points that you need to know. So first we learned the definition and terminology, then we understood the classification, what is inactive active and then we understood the five subtypes and we also understood what is eosinophilic otitis media. Now let's go to the pathology of each one of this. So in inactive mucosal disease, what are we seeing that this, there is a permanent perforation, the middle ear and mastoid are not inflamed. Very simple, we have already discussed this. What is active mucosal? There is a perforation but there is otoria, meaning there is a discharge that's coming from the middle ear. So they have varying degree of edema, varying degree of inflammation because the mucosa of the middle ear and mastoid is inflamed and because of 
this inflammation you will see that there is lymphocytes plasma cells histiocytes that accumulate in the exudate of the middle ear and there is granulation tissue that can occur and this granulation tissue it it proliferates it can also result in oral polyps which can protrude out through the tympanic membrane and if there is a chronic inflammation of the entire middle ear cleft which means that you station tube middle ear attic aditus antrum and all the mastoid air cells if there is a chronic inflammation of the middle ear cleft it is important that you resolve the inflammation of the entire system only then your perforation repair will become successful if you don't treat the you treat the eustachian tube do you think you have repaired the tympanic membrane will become successful no you have to treat the cause you have to treat the disease in the middle ear mastoid only then your repair of perforation will become successful now what is active mucosal active mucosal type of a disease is a condition where you see that there is destruction inflammation and you see that the ossicles are also involved the order in which these ossicles are involved are long process of incus stapes body of incus and manubrium and bony resorption or destruction occurs mainly due to osteoclastic activity and there is perforation of the pars tensa to the manubrium of the malleus so here you see that the middle ear is thickened there is active and chronic inflammation and sometimes you also see pus in the middle ear cavity so this is the concise pathophysiology of inactive mucosal so we understood the definition we understood what is happening there is a recruitment of inflammatory cells we understood that there is destruction because of osteoclastic activity we understood what is the order in which the ossicles are in involved to be in brief now active sorry inactive squamous cell because of negative pressure what do we see we see that there is a retraction pocket now this retraction pocket does not have any keratin debris or any inflammation inflammation now here what we see is there is an invagination of the part of the tympanic membrane into the middle ear space this can be fixed where it is adherent to the structures of the middle ear it can be free retraction pocket where it is not adherent and can move medially and laterally and it is not it is a mobile a tympanic membrane it's not fixed to the structures of the middle ear and epidermization is a more advanced form of retraction where you see that there is replacement of middle ear mucosa meaning the cuboidal epithelium of middle ear is being transformed into stratified squamous epithelium and here it does not involve the keratin debris at all so very important in cholestatoma there will be keratin debris but in an inactive squamous cell what we see is retraction we don't see the keratin debris the retraction can be either free it can be fixed or there can be epidermization fixed is it is adherent free is it is retracted but it is not fixed to the middle ear structures and epidermization is replacement of middle ear mucosa with keratinizing epithelium but you do not see any retention of keratin debris here in inactive squamosal so what do we see in active squamosal in active squamosal you will see that there is an epithelial lined sac with keratin debris that is seen within the middle ear or in the mastoid so here we can see that these are cholesteatomas which can cause destruction of the ossicular structures of the inner ear of the otic capsule and now the destruction is not because of osteoclastic activity it is because of production of proteolytic enzymes like collagenase acid phosphatase alkaline phosphatase and other proteolytic enzymes and as this is a destructive disease it can cause lot of hearing loss it can cause vestibular dysfunction facial nerve involvement intracranial involvement labyrinthine involvement jugular anti sigmoid sinus involvement and hence it's a destructive or an unsafe disease whereas if you go to the development of cholestate uh, if you go to the pathogenesis you will see that it is due to retraction of the pars flaccida in the posterior superior quadrant and over period of time because of various theories that are being explained we will see that there is a retraction pocket that is having keratin debris accumulated either because of negative pressure either because of metaplasia either because of basal cell hyperplasia either because of epithelial invagination and there are various other theories. 
theories. So this was a prelude to the chapter chronic otitis media and again if you guys like this chapter do mention in the comment section that you want part 2 and I shall come back again with the part 2. So with this I'll take your leave and I hope you guys have understood the brief chapter chronic otitis media definition and the beginning of the pathophysiology and you know now how to represent your answers as well. Take care and bye bye.